Hello everyone, welcome to Probability and Statistics for Data Science. Today we're going to talk about correlation, which is a measure of the linear dependence between two uncertain quantities. The goal of this video is to provide an overview of how all the different topics related to correlation that we have covered in individual videos fit together at a high level. Therefore, we will be skipping a lot of the details, but you have those details in the individual videos. Let's get to it. We're going to give an overview of correlation. Why do we talk about correlation to begin with? Well, we want to quantify the dependence between two quantities with a single number. We know how to quantify dependence between two quantities using their joint distribution, joint PDF or joint PMF, but those objects can be a little bit complicated to work with in some cases. They can be difficult to estimate from data sometimes. So we want a single number that summarizes the relationship between two quantities. In order to achieve that, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on linear dependence between the quantities. As we will see later on, we're sacrificing some information, but we will be able to summarize the linear dependence with a single number, which is extremely convenient. The topics that we're going to cover are going to be correlation, the correlation coefficient and covariance, both their definition and their properties. We're going to provide some geometric intuition about correlation. We're going to talk about simple linear regression. And finally, we'll discuss the relationship between correlation and causal inference. OK, so how can we quantify the linear dependence between two random variables that represent uncertain quantities of interest? Well, we can see whether we can approximate one of the quantities as a linear function of the other. If we focus on random variables with zero mean and unit variance, the best linear estimator of B given A can be obtained by just scaling A by the mean of the product between A and B. We call this quantity the correlation coefficient between um, A and B because it captures to what extent we can approximate B given A. In Gaussian random variables, it turns out that this correlation coefficient completely determines the joint PDF of the two random variables. But this is not the case for more general random variables that can have nonlinear dependence. OK, so what about random variables that have non-zero mean or non-unit variance? Well, in order to generalize this definition to those random variables, we introduce this operation called standardization where we take a random variable, we subtract its mean to center it so that it has zero mean, and we divide by the standard deviation to normalize it so that its variance equals one. As you can see, the standardized version of a random variable has zero mean and unit variance, so we can apply the previous result to it. So now, if we have two random variables A and B, which have non-zero means and non-unit variances, and we want to approximate B by A, we can apply this trick where we first say, OK, I can write B in terms of its standardized version. I just have to scale it by the standard deviation and add back the mean. But now I know how to estimate this guy linearly using the standardized counterpart of A because it has zero mean and unit variance. That's just this quantity, which we defined as the correlation coefficient, times the standardized variable. I can plug that in, and this gives me an affine estimate of B given A. Why is it affine? Because we have some constants here. But people often refer to this as the best linear estimator. You know, this, this detail that this is affine is of mathematical interest. It doesn't really matter. OK, so we have achieved, well, we have found an affine approximation of B given A. It turns out that this is optimal from the mean squared point of view. You cannot do better than this approximation. So we call this the minimum MSC linear estimator or the linear minimum MSC estimator of B given A. Now we can um, generalize our definition of correlation coefficient to go beyond random variables that have zero mean and unit variance. What we say is we define the correlation coefficient as the correlation coefficient between the standardized variables. This is uh, very useful because it gives us a measure of linear dependence that is invariant to positive scaling and shifts. If I uh, 
scale or shift each of the variables, as long as the scaling is positive, then we're going to keep the same correlation coefficient between. Which makes sense, right? Because linear transformations should not change the linear dependence between the two random variables. Now, if we write out the definition of the correlation coefficient as the correlation coefficient of the two standardized variables, which, if you remember, was the mean of their product, then we have this expression here where, where we have the, the mean value of the product between the centered random variables, and then we're dividing by the standard deviations. This quantity up here, which is the mean of the centered products, is called the covariance of the two random variables, and clearly it's, um, it's proportional to the correlation coefficient between the standardized variables. So when one of them is positive, the other one is also positive. When one of them is negative, the other one is negative. And when one of them is zero, the other one is zero. Okay, the covariance between two random variables captures the linear dependence between them. And oftentimes in, um, in many books, you will see this defined first, the covariance between two random variables, and then the correlation coefficient is defined, let me skip to that, as a normalized version of the covariance. There's this weird alarm uh, out of my window. Hopefully it will stop now. I don't know if you hear it. It sounds a bit funny. So it turns out that by linearity of expectation, you can write the covariance as the mean of the products minus the product of the means, and we often use that expression when we're computing things. When the correlation coefficient and the covariance are both positive, we say that A and B are positively correlated. The linear dependence within, with, uh, between them is directly proportional, as you can see here in this example. When they're negative, no, sorry, when they're zero, we say that the two random variables are uncorrelated. There is no linear dependence between them. You can see that's in the, that in that example there. And when they are negatively correlated, they are inversely proportional. The linear de their linear dependence is inversely proportional. When A is positive, A and B is, let me get this right, negative. And when A is negative, B is positive. This sounds great, but up to now we have only talked about random variables. What if we have some data and we want to compute correlations? Well, then what we do is we approximate the sample covariance using averages. So we had the mean of the two centered random variables. Now we're going to compute the sample mean of the centered quantities, the product of the centered quantities. How are we going to center? Using the sample means of each of the entries. So notice that here we need data where we have joint examples of the two quantities that we want to compare. Otherwise, we cannot compute a correlation between them. We need to see examples where we observe instances of both quantities. What we do is we separate among the two different quantities. We compute the, the sample mean of each of them. We use that to center the data. Then we compute the product and we average over that. And that gives us the sample covariance. You might have noticed that here we're dividing by n minus 1. This is not very important. It's just so that the estimator is unbiased. We're going to talk much more about that in future videos. In practice, it doesn't really make a difference. Once we have a sample covariance, we can compute the sample correlation coefficient by taking that sample covariance and dividing by the sample standard deviation, which are also computed from the data. Okay, the, we can compute the sample variances, as we have discussed in the past. And then we just divide by the square root of the product of the sample variances. This gives us the sample correlation coefficient of a data set. Let's take a look at an example. Here we're going to um, explore the relationship between height and the rebounds, assists, and points um, ach obtained, achieved by a player in the NBA between 1996 and 2019. This is the scatter plot of height and rebounds. This is the kernel density estimate where we see a bit better where all the points are because a lot of the points are on top of each other. And when we compute, um, when we standardize the variables, this is what we see. Then we have this linear estimate that where the slope is equal to the correlation coefficient. That correlation coefficient is equal to 0 0.42. And this is the error that we make when we estimate um, when we estimate, in this case, rebounds using the linear estimate based on height. Okay. In this case, 
height and rebounds are positively correlated, which makes a lot of sense because taller players tend to grab more rebounds. If we look at assists, this is the scatter plot, this is the kernel density estimate. We do the same thing again. In this case, the linear estimate has negative slope, which indicates that the two quantities are negatively correlated, which makes sense because shorter players tend to give more assists in, in basketball. Finally, we look at height and points. That's a scatter plot. This is the kernel density, this is the, de the estimate of the density between height and points. And now when we look at the linear estimate, its slope is almost zero, indicating that height and points are almost uncorrelated. There's no clear linear dependence between um, height and points. Well, maybe they're slightly negatively correlated. That's all we can say. Let's go on to our geometric intuition of correlation. It turns out that we can interpret random variables as vectors. What do I mean by that? Well, they satisfy the mathematical definition of a vector, which means that you can sum the random variables and they are still a random variable, and you can scale the random variables and they're still a random variable. And uh, the random variables defined on a probability space can be interpreted as a vector space, meaning that when I perform these operations, I still get new random variables within the same probability space. Why is this important? It's important because we can actually show that the covariance is a valid inner product within that probability space, and that enables us to interpret a lot of the quantities that we've been talking about geometrically. If we interpret the covariance as an inner product, then the length of the vector is equal to its standard deviation. The more a random variable fluctuates, uh, the longer it is in this vector space. I should say, by the way, that this only works out, this covariance as an inner product, if the, uh, if the random variables are all centered so that they have zero mean, but that's easy to do. Okay, so here again we see that the length is equal to the standard deviation. And the relationship between variables can also be captured through this inner product. It turns out that the cosine of the angle between these two vectors in this abstract space is equal to the correlation coefficient. And that's really nice because then we can recover a lot of the uh, properties of correlation exploiting this analogy. So we know that the cosine of an angle is between minus one and one, and it turns out that so is the correlation coefficient. When the, co the, co the cosine between two vectors um, is positive, that means that the vectors point in the same direction. In the analogy with random variables, uh, when the correlation coefficient is positive, the random variables are positively correlated. So we can think of this as the, these vectors representing the variables pointing in the same direction. When the cosine is negative, vectors point in the opposite directions. In our analogy, that means that the random variables are negatively correlated. When the cosine is zero, the vectors are orthogonal. And this, in our analogy, that means that A and B are uncorrelated. So um, there is no linear dependence between them. There, um, the vectors are orthogonal, the random variables are uncorrelated. There's, these two concepts are equivalent in the analogy. I don't know if this helped me doing like this with my hands. Uh, anyways, so now we're going to talk about regression and we'll go back to this geometric uh, perspective because we're going to see that it's going to allow us to, opt, uh, to solve the linear regression problem in the case of a single feature. But I'm not, I don't want to get ahead of myself. The problem of regression is that of estimating a quantity of interest, a response from observed features. In simple linear regression, we only have a single feature and we restrict ourselves to a linear estimator, rather a, to an affine estimator, because we also add a constant, but people like to call this the linear minimum MSC estimator, so we're going to go with that. And it turns out that we can obtain it in exactly the way we had explained before when we were talking about approximating B as an affine estimator of A. So the first thing that we did is we said, well, we can write B in terms of the standardized version of B, if you remember. Now we plug in the correlation coefficient here, which we have now defined as the correlation coefficient between A and B, not only as the correlation coefficient between the standardized versions of A and B, and that gives us this, um, this estimate. It turns out that this is optimal from the point of view of MSE, 
as we had mentioned before and it also turns out that we could have actually derived this directly with our geometric analogy between random variables and vectors why because the msc in our analogy the mean squared error between b and its estimate in our analogy is just the distance between b and the estimate the estimate here we have centered random variables has to lie on this line so what is sorry that the line is a little bit squiggly what is the point that is closest to b on that line that goes through a well we we need to make sure that we go orthogonally to a perpendicularly to a to ensure that this is the closest right like this is this what minimizes the distance it's just the orthogonal projection of b onto that line that actually gives exactly the expression that i have just shown you for the linear minimum mean squared estimator of a b given a so we can actually derive this from a completely geometric point of view using the fact that the covariance is like an inner product you should take a look at the video for on on that topic for more details but i just wanted to you know show you where it where it fits in in this whole story what if we want to do simple linear regression from data again we need data points where we see both quantities the feature and the response that we want to estimate and what we can do is we can interpret the feature values as a sample from the random variable representing the feature and the response values as samples from the random variable representing the response we write our estimate our linear minimum mean squared error estimate and now we plug in the sample uh, versions of all these quantities so the sample standard deviations the sample means and the sample correlation coefficient Okay, this gives us this expression that we can compute from our data set and it turns out that this expression actually minimizes the least squares error within the data set. So if we had just take, if you had, if we had just said we want to find the affine estimator that minimizes the sum of squared errors between the affine estimate and the response, we would have arrived at exactly the same estimate. Uh, because of this, this is called the ordinary least squares estimator. Let's take a look at what it looks like. This is what the ordinary least squares estimator looks like for uh, when we're trying to estimate rebounds from height in this data set. I'm also showing you the best nonlinear estimate, which is an approximation of the conditional mean of rebounds given height. You can see that this nonlinear estimate is noisy where we don't have a lot of data. So that's like that's um, an advantage of the linear estimate. It's less prone to overfitting because it's much simpler. However, and this is more obvious here in, uh, when we look at height and assists, the linear estimator is missing some structure which cannot be captured by just a line. In this case, we see that the nonlinear estimator is kind of constant for very tall players and very short players. And that makes a lot of sense because short players have the same role they're point guards so once we're within that subdivision of players height is not going to uh, determine that a player gives more or less assists and the same for very tall players however we cannot capture this with a line so the linear estimate is forced to be a line and uh, the line that we see there is the best line oops i don't know what i did there uh let me go back Okay, miraculously it went back on my iPad, it, this disappeared for a moment. The line that we see there, the dashed black line, is the best line, and it cannot account for this nonlinear structure. So there's this trade-off between the nonlinear estimate and the linear estimate. Here we see both estimates for height and points. The nonlinear estimate is going to be noisier, but it's going to capture more structure. All right, so now let's talk about the, correlation, the properties of the correlation coefficient. We already mentioned them when we talked about our geometric, uh, our geometric perspective on correlation. The correlation coefficient is always bounded between minus 1 and 1. If it equals plus 1 or minus 1, it means there's complete linear dependence. So if we look at the scatter plot of two quantities that have correlation coefficient close to 1, what we're going to see is that the two quantities are going to tend to be exactly on a line meaning that one is a linear function of the other. And to show you this, let's take a look at what happens if we start pushing the correlation coefficient up. Indeed, we end up almost on a line. We proved all of these properties, by the way, 
but I'm not going to reprove them here. You can look at the video on the properties of the correlation coefficient. Okay, now we have arrived at a very important point. Up to now, we have been talking about the correlation coefficient as giving us a very good linear estimate of a quantity given the other, but the correlation coefficient captures more information. It captures how good the linear estimate is. In order to um, arrive at that result, we have to talk about variance decomposition. Turns out that we can decompose the variance of B as the sum of the variance of the linear estimator and the sum of the error or residue. This is because the residual is uncorrelated with A and also with the linear estimator, as we showed. What is the variance of each of these two points? Well, the variance of the residual is 1 minus the correlation coefficient squared times the variance of B, and the variance of the linear estimate is the correlation coefficient squared times the variance of B. This is crucial. Basically, when the correlation coefficient approaches 1, the linear estimator captures all the variance in our quantity of interest. When it approaches zero, the linear estimator uh, captures no variance. So the correlation coefficient not only gives you the estimate, it also tells you how good the estimate is. In fact, there is this measure of how good a linear approximation is, which is called the coefficient of determination, or R squared, which is the variance of the linear estimator divided by the variance of the quantity that we want to approximate. And this is between 0 and 1, because it equals the squared correlation coefficient. Let's take a look at some examples. If two quantities are uncorrelated, that means that the linear estimate is flat. Now we're going to look at the variance of just the B quantity in these graphs. So what we see is that the variance of the linear estimate is 0. It's just a constant. We're not accounting for any of the information in here. Okay? You see that the variance of the residual is the same as the variance of the quantity that we want to estimate. This is encoded here in the correlation coefficient, which is zero, which means that the coefficient of determination is also zero. If the, coefficient, if the, if the um, correlation coefficient is 0 0.75, its square is equal to 0 0.56, this means that out of the variance of B here, the linear estimate accounts for more than half of it. So you can see this here. These are the histograms of the B um, coordinate of all of these points, you see that the variance is equal to 1, and indeed the linear estimator accounts for more than half of the variance. And the residual accounts for the rest because we have this variance decomposition. If the correlation coefficient is even higher, then the linear estimate accounts for even more variance, in this case 90%, and the residual has much, uh, much less variance. In our analogy, basically what we're saying is that this decomposition of variance is Pythagoras' theorem. The squared length of this guy is equal to the sum of the squared length of the residual and of the linear estimator. And uh, basically, this is governed by the cosine of the angle between uh, B and A, which is equal to the correlation coefficient. The length of this guy is the square root of 1 minus that cosine squared times the length of this guy, and the length of this guy is square root of the cosine squared times the length. If you want to have a laugh at my expense, you can go back to this video. Here, for some reason, I just suddenly went crazy. My brain got short-circuited, and I decided that this was a typo. I guess I got confused because it's a bit strange that we say, okay, we have the correlation coefficient, and its square is equal to the coefficient of determination, and the coefficient of determination is called R squared. So I got confused there. There is a square there, okay? Uh, sorry about that. I'm not going to re-record the video just because of that. And, you know, it, it, it's kind of funny to see how sometimes I go crazy. Anyways, so it turns out that independence actually implies uncorrelation. I'm switching topics here a little bit quickly, but basically independence is lack of any uh, dependence between variables. Uncorrelation is lack of linear dependence, so it stands to reason that when we look at the covariance between two independent random variables, it's equal to zero. The opposite is not true. This is a very simple example of two random variables where we can easily show that the covariance between them is zero. If we try to estimate you know, B and A, basically the best thing you can do is have like a line, a horizontal line there, zero covariance. But 
clearly they're not independent because if you look at the, um, the conditional distribution of b when a is equal to zero, it's just equal to one point. It's equal to um, zero with probability one. But if a is equal to one, then b is equal to either one or minus one with the same probability. So the conditional distribution completely changes. In general, covariance does not imply independence. However, it does imply independence for Gaussian random variables. So here, if the correlation coefficient between two random variables is zero, uh, here we're showing contour lines of the densities. In that case, in the case where the correlation coefficient is zero, the two random variables are actually independent. And you can see that by essentially slicing the joint distribution and realizing that all of these conditional PDFs that we're going to obtain by slicing in this way are going to be exactly the same only when the correlation coefficient is zero. Okay, so for random for Gaussian random variables, and correlation does imply independence, but not in general. And finally, we have arrived at one of the most important topics, which is almost mandatory in any course on statistics, which is the relationship between correlation and um, and causal inference. So here I'm showing you a scatter plot of the unemployment um, and the temperature in Spain between 2015 and 2022, and there is negative correlation. Does that mean that an increase in temperature will decrease unemployment? I can almost imagine politicians in Spain saying like, don't worry, you know, global warming is going to take care of this. Our disastrous management will, you know, <laughs> will have no, no, no ill effects uh, like in a couple of years because it will get warmer. So uh, the unemployment will just go down. Look at the data. Of course, that makes absolutely no sense. Okay, if we increase the temperature in Spain by two degrees, it's likely that the unemployment would not uh, decrease because of that. So this, this kind of shows the difficulties in, interpret, in interpreting correlation in terms of causal effects. In order to do that, let's introduce the mathematical framework of causal inference in order to see whether we can interpret correlation in terms of causal effects. The key question here is, does a certain variable that we call the treatment cause a certain outcome of interest? Notice that here we're using outcomes as in causal inference. This is just a variable of interest. It's not like an outcome in a probability space, in case you're um, confused by that. We're going to define something called the potential outcome, which tells us how a certain quantity would behave for different values of the treatment. In our example, this would tell us what the unemployment would be like for different values of the temperature. The key challenge here is that we only get to see one of those values. We only get to see the unemployment for the temperature that actually happened, not for the other possible temperatures. Those other possible values of the potential outcome of interest are called counterfactuals because they're counter to reality. They didn't really happen. This is easier to see on, um, in an example. So here I'm showing you a situation where I have a certain treatment, which would be the temperature in our uh, example. And this is the potential outcome. We only get to see this because this is the temperature that actually happened. But if there had been another temperature, actually the outcome would be constant. It wouldn't have changed anything. In this case, the treatment has no causal effect on this outcome. At another time, because of, you know, like things change, we would see a different potential outcome. In this case, the temperature was here. So we observed this outcome. Again, things would be constant. Notice that for this data point, the potential outcome is completely different to this other data point. We only get to observe one point. That's the key. Again, another data point that we get to see. We saw this value because the treatment happened to be here. If the treatment had been here, we would have observed the same value. Um, in case you're getting potentially confused by this, you could have situations where the, this looks completely different, right? Like the potential outcomes can be whatever they are. They could be like this, for example. Okay, this is just a simple example where it turns out that the treatment has no causal effect on the potential outcome. So what is the difficulty here? The difficulty is that we don't get to see the potential outcomes for any other treatment other than the one that, we, that actually happened. So this is the data set that we observe in our simple example. And you can already begin to see that this is kind of problematic because there was no causal effect. But when I look at the data, it, it seems clear that the observed outcome is 
proportional to the treatment. So what is going on here? Well, it turns out that if you want to estimate causal effects, we're going to need a certain assumption. In order to reach that, first we're going to define exactly what we're after. We're going to try to estimate linear causal effects, where on average, the treatment, um, on average, the treatment has a linear effect on the potential outcome of interest. In our simple example here, beta would be zero because we saw that you know, they were all flat on average. There's no effect of uh, the treatment. In other cases, there might be an effect and we want to find it. Again, we're looking for the mean effect. The question is, can we estimate this from data? The idea is that if indeed there is a linear relationship between the outcome and the treatment, we should be able to see it in the data through the correlation or the covariance between the outcome and the treatment. And indeed, you can as long as the potential outcome and the treatment are independent for all t. In that case, the covariance actually gives you this, um, this beta that we are after. So in our case, if this was unemployment and um, just to clarify, if this was unemployment and temperature, the beta would tell you on average how much unemployment goes down when the temperature is increased by one degree or two degrees. And, no, by one degree. Sorry. OK, uh, this is assuming here. This result in particular is assuming that we have uh, centered the treatment and normalized it. OK, so now you might be a bit confused because you're saying, how can the treatment and the outcome be independent? This makes no sense if there's this linear effect. Well, what is important to realize is that this is um, independence between the treatment and the potential outcome. So if we go back to the picture, essentially what this is saying is that I cannot select the treatment that I'm seeing based on the underlying potential outcome. I have to select it independently. Why is this important? Because if they are dependent, I can do something like this. I can say, oh, every time I see that the potential outcome is uh, very high, I'm going to take a treatment here. And when I see that the potential outcome is very low, I'm going to take a treatment here. And this is exactly how this spurious correlation between the treatment and the observed outcome is generated here by choosing treatments on the right when the whole potential outcome is high and treatment and choosing treatments on the left when the whole potential outcome is low. If you have independence, you cannot look at the potential outcome while choosing the treatment. You're not going to be able to produce these patterns. You're going to basically sample somewhere random. And if there is no causal effect, we're going to actually see basically a cloud of points that are kind of all over the place because we won't have been able to generate this spurious correlation by choosing the treatment based on the potential outcome. So again, it's independence between the treatment and the potential outcome, not between the treatment and the observed outcome. Hopefully that makes sense. If we go back to our example with unemployment and the temperature in Spain, then what we see here is that there is a confounding variable, which is the number of tourists in Spain. This is color coded. Lighter color means more tourists. We see that there are more tourists when the temperature is warmer and tourists do have a causal effect on unemployment. If there's more tourists, there are more jobs, there's less unemployment. So there's this confounding factor that distorts the correlation between temperature and unemployment. This unobserved confounder um, prevents us from being able to estimate linear causal effects from, uh, the, the, from the treatment because we're not randomizing because we're the I forgot to say this actually because the potential outcome and the treatment are not independent. How can you achieve independence between the potential outcome and the treatment? Well, you have to randomize, but in this case, we cannot randomize, right? We cannot set the temperature in Spain at random and then measure unemployment. We can, unfortunately, we just cannot do that. So, in order to make this more precise, we defined the potential outcomes also based on the treatment and on a confounding factor that could be unobserved just to mathematically analyze this phenomenon. And what we saw is that um, if we assume there's a linear relationship between the potential outcome, the average, the mean of the potential outcome and both the treatment and the confounder, 
when we look at the covariance between the observed outcome and the treatment, we have what we want, which is this relationship between the treatment and the outcome, but there is another term that includes the unobserved confounder. Notice that this term is going to distort the correlation unless either gamma is zero, which means that the confounder does not affect the observed um, does not observe the, and does not affect the outcome of interest, or if the correlation, maybe I will, or if the correlation between the treatment and the confounder is zero. And this is what we achieve when we randomize. By randomizing, we ensure that that correlation is going to be zero, and hence we can estimate beta uh, perfectly from the covariance. But unfortunately, it's usually very expensive and difficult to randomize, and sometimes even impossible, as in our example, with unemployment and temperature. Um, yeah, and that's all I have. Um, this was an overview of correlation. We went from a definition of the correlation coefficient and covariance. Uh, we looked at, we started with that. We looked at the properties of the correlation coefficient, which gives you the best linear estimate, but also tells you how good this linear estimate is. We talked about how to have a geometric perspective on the estimator. Um, we took a look at linear, uh, simple linear regression, which is extremely related. Uh, actually, the, the correlation coefficient immediately gives you the solution for simple linear regression. And we saw that our geometric intuition about correlation can actually help us to derive linear regression just in geometric terms as a projection, as an orthogonal projection. And finally, we talked about correlation and causal inference, and we saw that in general, we have to be very careful when we interpret correlation in terms of causal effects. And that's all I have. Thank you very much.